Hello and welcome to a live code hangout where we will be working with the Langchain project and OpenAI GPT 3.5 I believe possibly 4. I've got a repository here on GitHub if you'd like to check it out paste it in chat so it's clear where you can view the code the initial steps are this is just familiarization so just trying things out seeing how it works and i'd like to kind of get familiar with the basic concepts graphically if possible so i've got this project running called langflow which is a drag and drop user interface for langchain Ah, sorry, that's the wrong project. I was sponsored out Langflow. It's Python based and it's modular. And I'm looking forward to these integrations, particularly being able to read and write data from sources like Hacker News or Wikipedia, and then perhaps saving information to Notion, Google Drive. So it seems like a really interesting project. <laughs> so the documentation is also fairly good and one thing I wish I had would be a dark mode because I'm just it's a bit hard on my eyes to read bright mode so we've got it installed it allows you to use hugging space models which is pretty cool but for now I will just stick with open AI but essentially the flows so we don't need this repo it's basically just running length flow is the only thing that the VS code is doing right now so we can go ahead and maximize this I suppose really bright interesting dark mode please i used to think it was a fad but no it's just really it hurts my eyes to read bright text backgrounds it's just a, like having a flashlight in your face so bright mode only websites are somewhat painful to read and feel like having a flashlight shining right into your eyes please support dark mode for langflow and the langflow documentation um bright brightness you can see my video it's like i'm almost getting a suntan <laughs> oh my gosh i mean granted i have lighting because the video is dark the room's kind of dark but i mean the lighting doesn't hurt my eyes like the lang chain lang flow ui maybe there is a dark mode oh man did i need a screenshot here <laughs> it hurts it like hurts my eyes <laughs> Out of curiosity, how difficult would it be to implement a dark mode? What are we using? For example, what are we using for the docs? I think the docs are here. Uh, oh, docs right here. Okay, so for docs, docsaurus, docsaurus theme, theme config, mdxb2, docusaurus, styling and layout, theme configuration. Ah, oh, look at this nice dark mode. Dark mode whale whale. That's a good question. So it seems like it should be just a default mode. All main themes. Tell me MDX is a main theme. Dark source. Dark you source. Theme classic. And we are using Preset classic theme MDXV2. Just what is this? What is MDXV2? Ah, uh, okay, so that's Markdown. Yeah, I have seen that JSX Markdown. Okay, so that's not quite the right. I'm getting close though. I'm getting close. Just is there dark in here? Dark. Light? Light code the. It's only used. Oh, here we go. Two and three. It's used there. It's created there. Not really used. Well, maybe if I, <laughs> this would be an interesting thing just to get off on a tangent, but maybe if I install this and run it locally. Yeah, let's just try it out. All right, so going into the source, this is what I like about open source. If there's a problem, you can try to fix it. Ooh, we'll clone it. So, VS Code, done with spectacle. One moment. Ping tonic and lime. Cool. Langflow. Langflow. Yeah, we'll we'll open the whole thing. I trust. 
there is a dev container. That's kind of cool. I'll leave it alone for now. I, I appreciate that though. We're gonna go to the docks though and work with those a bit. Docks. I'm gonna get swept away in the NPM yarn, NPX, bun debacle. I just don't have time. But basically, okay, there's tail in config. Ooh. Um, where was I reading this? Okay, so the DocuSource configuration and DocuSource dark mode. Theme configuration, color mode, the classic theme. So we can theme config, DocuSource config, export default, yada yada. So we're, that's, this is export default, basically module exports. I, mean, I think the same thing. Theme config, so here we go. Let's find that key. Preset classic, looking good, looking good. Color mode. And they just disabled the switch, why? Just give people a choice, seriously. Probably something to do with some syntax highlighting or other diagrams or some other plugin, but no, really give people a choice and fix the bug with the false. I'm gonna open a pull request with this. All right, let's see what it looks like with a dark mode switch. Okay, there it is. Simple as that, wow. It's a lot easier on the eyes. Now why I'm thinking it has to do with diagrams or, you know, these aren't so bad, but I can see like it is a bit of a inconsistent at least, but it's less lightness, less brightness on the eyes. But you can see when I scroll past that, it's like flashlight going through a tunnel, out of the tunnel, in the tunnel, out of the tunnel. Honestly, those are only a few flashes, but it's not like a strobe effect where you're doing that all the time. So that's a simple pull request. I will do that. Excuse me. Lang flow. I will edit this. In order to do so, I will fork it. And yeah, respect user preferences. This whole thing, you know, if, my, if I've got dark mode in my operating system for whatever reason and it's an evening and I'm in low light mode be respectful of users preferences to allow so allow users to use dark mode it's nice to allow users to choose light or dark mode based on their own needs such as sensitivity to bright light I think that's a pretty fair request hopefully you know I did it in a polite way hopefully and with comments to describe why I thought it was important so let's check it out creating the pull request dark mode that was 115 Yes, create pull request. And they can edit it, of course, if they don't like my comments. All right, so there's one improvement to the documentation. Hopefully, that'll get merged. I'll take a quick break and refresh my tonic water. Great. Now, out of curiosity, you know, for Langflow itself, how is the color mode set? Might be more complicated there, but might be using a front end CSS framework that supports that because, like, you know, it's fairly conventional for these CSS frameworks to now support dark mode. It's, like I was saying, I originally thought it was a fad to have dark mode. It even took me a while to adopt dark mode in my IDE circa 2015. I was like, what? I want light mode. But really, it, literally, it just, I get it now. It hurts. It's bright. And these, Screens are getting increasingly large, and they're essentially big flashlights, high re high definition flashlights. So you have a white page that is basically beaming light in your eyes all day, and our bodies are affected by that. Our neurology and physiology is affected by this brightness. So let's see. We've got post CSS config, tailwind, Invite, interesting. So I'm thinking Vite is the, it's the build tool, isn't it? No, it's the, well, it's the playwright, it's prettier. Uh, let's just see if I can find the um, framework they're using. Start Nginx, start proxy. So first I would start with uh, package JSON just to see what their commands are, I guess. Radix, so probably React. Yeah, React stuff. Okay, so Vite is the build tool and Command runner. So what does Vite got in it? I know you're supposed to be saying it some other way, but that 
that's the way I'm saying it. Dark mode, right there, class. Maybe I'm just totally missing it, but it was literally in the documentation excluded. You, they disabled the toggle. At least I'm seeing some light here, so that, that and we can enable dark mode. Uh, Daisy UI, okay. Where do I, dark mode. In source, front end, oh wait. Dot, 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 there we go. Dark, almost dark gray, so some color definition. They have dark theme. Again, good uh, possibility here. Maybe there's something up here I was just overlooking. Or just a little toggle. Or my settings, it's not running anymore. All right, uh, inflow org. So hopefully the docs will be fixed soon. Still thinking about it. Code QL takes forever, man. So we did find the doc source. So if I can close that, I know now where Markdown X is. It's like they have the support for dark mode, but no toggle. So that's cool. Maybe I can just add the toggle. This is more of a feature that would have to be added, I think, using the class strategy. I think that's what they mean here. Ah, you have to use it on your HTML element. Okay. Dark mode media is the default value and it does not require it to write explicit. So what happens if I say media? You can do both apparently. Because I'm afraid if I do, well media then class. Perhaps if I specify them in that order, it'll prefer media if it's available or default to the class. Now that dark mode is a first class feature of many operating systems, it's becoming more and more common to design a dark version of your website to go along with the default design. To make this as easy as possible, Tailwind includes a dark variant that lets you style your site differently when dark mode is enabled. By default, this uses prefers color scheme CSS media feature, but you can also build sites that support toggling dark mode manually using the class strategy. Interesting. Dark mode class, BG white, dark BG. Will be white, dark mode not enabled, dark mode enabled, class is dark. Int if you've set a prefix on your Tailwind config, be sure to add that dark class. Supporting system preferences and manual selection. Though. The class strategy can be used to support both the user system preferences or a manually selected mode using the window match media API. Some frameworks like NativeScript have their own approach to enabling dark mode and add a different class name when dark mode is active. You can customize the dark mode selector by name by setting dark mode to an array with your custom selector. So yeah, now that's tr not trivial. Tailwind does support it. Hmm. But in order to toggle that, the front end would have to have a... some JavaScript in the base um, template layer, somewhere like navbar or whatever that sets some thing in local storage, let's get just which is typically done by higher level themes. So I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this change. I'm not familiar enough with TypeScript and things like that. Logo SVG. Okay, so I'm just clicking randomly now. Okay. That one is just a heck of a you know a lot of code. You'd have to add this all. You'd have to add this all throughout your code base now because you got utilities splattered everywhere. That's just ridiculous. Man, I could just imagine if they hadn't done this yet. You'd have to go through every single template, every single file, um, every partial. That's crazy making, rather than some kind of a cascade or inheritance. Hmm. Maybe it has some inheritance scheme if you just set the higher level con um, components, but yeah, wow, incredible. Yeah, if you just set it here and everything inside of here is <laughs> gonna follow those two, but yeah, man. So, 
I did a cursory check of that. All right. So localhost 3000, welcome to Langflow. How to install. I think it's the code blocks is why, but you know what? A little bit of bright code blocks compared to having everything just blaringly bright, I'll take it. Uh, yeah, same thing with these prefixes. I think there's a few elements that are... So if I print screen here, It'll work, there we go. Rectangular region. Copy. Code blocks. Uh, what was that other one? So just code defenses. You know, these are minor details. Rectangular region. However, th these are code fences also. So there's something special about those. Copy that. Okay, spans with hard coded color. There's something GitHub Light. Inline code GitHub Light theme. That's all right. I just think it's the uh, these. Uh, it's all the uh, GitHub Light theme things. So, um, perhaps videos and some dial, uh, I was thinking diagram, but those aren't loading for me. Could be a way to get that toggle to swap the GitHub light and GitHub dark. I'm not sure exactly how that is even done, but I did, I'm going to just look at all the pages as requested. I think I did the tools already. Oh man. Utilities, vector stores, those, async API, did I miss one? Same. Hey, that's interesting. Prompt template. This is what I want to do is read through this, but it's so painful. It's so painful. Even the code examples, they jump out at you. Yep, it's just all the same. Anything with GitHub, anything with GitHub Light. Could we could we settle on something? Why do these need to be uh, GitHub Light? They probably don't. In fact, uh, inspect that. All right, container here. Oh, wrapper. Ch theme GitHub Light. So yeah, uh, that would be good. I would say code should just be on GitHub Dark anyway. Maybe I can make that change. That should be a configuration setting. Hmm. So what is doing the code generation for the front end? Oh, no, I'm not staging these, what am I doing? So perhaps doc source has, let's open this, double clicking that and closing this. Code 
load. Prism React Renderer. Right there. Really? Oops, didn't work. Let's see. Let's run it again. Close these things I'm not using. That did work though. Now what if I have the light mode on and, and uh, oh yeah, I can just toggle that now because I've done that. Honestly though, that doesn't look bad. Honestly though, I would recommend this. I'll add that change as well in my branch. Okay, I forget where I went in. Did I change that? Right there. Okay. And it looks more natural because typically code editors in CLI environments are dark mode for historic reasons that the terminals didn't have, I suppose didn't want to use a lot of energy and also had like monochrome displays and yeah, it just hurts your eyes to look into a bright beam of light. Mm, yeah, so our minds are already accustomed to having these uh, dark mode backgrounds behind kind of programming language things. And then this just kind of makes it work holistically. And it's a compromise in between the two. They can, I uh, left the default to light mode. Cool. Yeah, a very quick uh, response from Gabriel Luis Freitas Almeida. Interesting. Cool. So I like that. The responsiveness in the community is a good sign. Log space AI. All right. So we'll just see how that goes. Got some in the comment there. So yeah, that's why I included the pictures, <clears throat> so that it was kind of clear. Dark mode should be supported in both, I believe. I think I'm not alone in that uh, kind of need or belief. It's becoming incredibly or increasingly common to have dark mode support in our tools. Every tool on my screen, GitHub and OBS and Twitch and you name it, there are my operating system is in a dark mode theme, my phone, uh, because we just, it's so much light, so much light and we can only take so much. There we go. My camera adjusts a little bit. My eyes are still straining. So I do want to work with it a bit. It makes it hard, legitimately makes it hard to work with this tool. I'm surprised. Okay, so what we're gonna do now, an hour in, is look at how things work. So you create a flow with Lang flow. You drag the sidebar components onto the canvas and connect them to create your pipeline. Flow provides a range of Langchain components to compose from, including large language models, prompt serializers, agents, and chains. Fork. The easiest way to start with Langflow is by forking a community example. Forking an example stores a copy in your project collection, allowing you to edit and save the modified version as a new flow. Build. Building a flow means validating the components have prerequisites fulfilled and are properly instantiated. When a chow message is sent, the flow will run for the first time, executing the pipeline. So that builds the little lightning button, I think. None of these work for me, strangely enough. It's like it tries to load and then fails. So there it found it. Nope, the embedded player. It's not a problem with that, it's the video is gone. 
Honestly, a screenshot would do here, and, but okay, video is fine. All right, so this is feeling a bit, it's well documented, so it's not like feeling alpha, but I mean, some growing pains, I guess. All right, so we'll come back to this. Ah, uh, nope. So is it still running? Let me see here. Locally or what's going on? So back to the lane flow. Uh, actually, I'll open my own little link flow repository and link chain experiments. Just open the terminal again. And this was right from source. Uh, activate the virtual environment. Use link flow start. I'll be right back. All right, so it's running again. And I've got some basic uh, examples running. It took me a bit of tinkering to figure out. I didn't have any credits on my open API account, open AI account. So we'll go, but I do have now a working flow. It doesn't, uh, that's not it probably. Let me find it. My collection. The time travel guide I think was a good one. And I wonder if I can persist this key in an environment variable. Open AI API key so I don't have to set that each time. Okay, and uh, my last session I used uh, one penny, so it's fairly cheap. Uh, so one thing I would like to check, we'll go half dark is uh, can I use re uh, environment variables here okay so this search is there a search yes you can use the environment variables to store your open AI API key this is a common practice uh, to keep sensitive information like API secure you can set the environment variable in your operating system all right so yeah I was thinking that I should just tried that but uh, it's a generic response is apparently this mendable is just not just searching the Langflow documentation. So I can, uh, I don't have the project running in a development mode here to view this source. So essentially, do they look for an environment variable for the open API, API key? I'm starting to think I'll be better off using just using Langchain directly, I don't know. Learning Langchain, learning how that works before going to, into Langflow. You know, like a Jupyter Lab project. Yeah, that's what I'll start doing. That way I'll commit more code uh, to this experiment. But man, it's nice because it has, you get a, a streaming chat interface real quick. All right, well, honestly, it's not that hard to uh, copy and paste it. Create a new API key, copy and paste it in each session. That's a bit, granted, I don't have to. I can store my, I can put it in plain text or something. All right, so yeah. I was just hoping I could put it in an ENV file and then these widgets and the like would load that up. Shift horizontal scroll would be kind of cool. So there we go. Temperature. Now let's see if I've got GPT-4. I, I tried that before, but I was out of um, money, so I think it just didn't work. So now we'll commit the changes and give it a try. I didn't get any bells. So there, when there's an error, oftentimes it comes over in these, these little bells here. And I might get an error here when I try it out. Testing. Hello, I'm ready to assist you. Which time period or future time would you like to explore? Okay, very cool. So I'm able to use GPT-4. The reason I like this graphical approach is it makes it more apparent what's going on, where these things are coming from and what they're doing. And it sort of shows me all the building blocks and it's organized in a nice categorical. So I can start familiarizing myself with the basic building blocks and how they interrelate. You know, it's also got these inputs and outputs that are that are documented and it tells me where to get a memory from and I can go over here to memories. So that's really cool. Conversational buffer memory, buffer window memory, entity, key, KG memory, station summary memory, Postgres chat message history. Oh, okay. So I can persist the messages in a Postgres database and a vector store retriever. Okay. So we've Got the idea here with creating flows. Um, they do have sign up and sign in. API keys, asynchronous processing. You know, I'm not sure the value of this, just I'm going to read about it. From version 0.5, Langflow introduces a new feature to its API. 
the sync flag. This flag allows users to opt for asynchronous processing of their flows, freeing up resources, enabling better control over long running tasks. This feature supports running tasks in a Celery worker queue or any IO task group. Interesting. Okay, so component. Components are the building blocks of flows. They are made of inputs, outputs, and parameters that define their functionality, providing a convenient and straightforward way to compose LLM-based applications. Learn more about components, how they work in their language chain documentation. So I'm glad it's not inventing its own constructs. It's sort of adhering to the chain. You know, I've heard complaints about LangChain being a very thin um, abstraction and you could implement all the LangChain uh, features yourself and such and such, but I mean, think the abstraction is the point, uh, even though some of the abstractions might only be a few lines of code. Uh, having a consistent uh, LLM applications, I believe, is, an, is adding value, though granted I'm just starting out. So let's see if we can find the component documentation. That's the LangChain developer itself, components. They have a dark mode, I'm already in it. Because my operating system is set to dark mode. So here's the thing I can fix this right off the bat. The components docs is broken docs langchain.com docs category components docs langchain.com docs integrations component conversation chain. Let's just see if there's a conversation chain here. I believe so. I think it's going to be. I think this is the right link, but it would probably be langchain API chains classes. I don't know the equivalent. Also by LangChain. Oh, this is the JavaScript one. But conversational memory sounds about right. However, I think I was at the right. Yeah, vector stores, retrievers, these are the components. So I'll just fix this. Okay, docs. Guidelines, components. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, there it goes. Oh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Get nice wrapping. Oh, uh, that's Python, though. So we get a 404. But I do notice it's gone to the Python by default. So So the components documentation contains a broken link to the LangChain components documentation. This pull request fixes the link. Two point to the LangChain integration slash components docs. Okay, we'll see. Let's see what happens. Anything else? Oh, thank you. Thank you, they merged it. Wow, that's cool. I like that. That really helped. Helps. Now maybe they'll get deployed soon. I don't know whether if they've uh, got a CI process for that, how that works. Uh, an action happening. Hey, bro, running on that. CodeQL is still running. Deploy to GitHub pages, let's see. Just one minute for last week. All right, so it looks like uh, there's a release process there. Makes sense. You probably don't want continuous integration on your docs site. Well, I don't know. Can I trigger it? <laughs> Last month. Hey, doesn't happen very often. Well, yeah, we're not that far into the month, so yeah. Anyway, all right, a couple weeks in. We'll have dark mode in the Langflow docs right up here. Okay, so yeah, components, features. During the flow creation process, you will notice if there's anybody in chat, let me just check nobody. During the flow creation process, you'll notice handles, colored circles attached to one or both sides of a component. The handles represent the availability to connect to other components, while their colors are type hints. Hover over a handle to see the connection details. I like this strongly typed graph programming. <laughs> For example, if you select a color or conversation chain component, you'll see orange and purple input handles. They indicate that the component accepts an LLM and memory component as inputs. The red asterisk means 
that at least one of the input types is required. So the LLM is required here. Uh, in the top right corner, you'll find the component status icon. Make sure, make the necessary connections and build the flow with the zap icon in the bottom right of the canvas. And once the validation is completed, the status of each validated component should be light green. So when we come over here to my flow, we see everything is light green. I zapped it. With my open API key, if I deleted that and I zap it, it'll turn red because it's misconfigured. And the parameters, length flow components can be edited in the component settings button. Hide parameters to reduce the complexity and keep the canvas clean for and intuitive for experimentation. Okay, components can be edited in the components settings button. Curious, curious. That is an interesting. Sounds interesting. Too bad the videos are all missing. Component settings button. Hide parameters to reduce the complexity and keep the canvas clean and intuitive. I like that. Hide the parameters. Oh, oh I see. Some components. Oh, all of them. You just have to make sure not to drag it all. Then there's edit documentation. There, okay, we're at the length chain docs. That's pretty cool. It jumps you right there. Copy and delete. Time trip. Okay, so this is our. It's a prompt chain. This is grayed out, so nothing happens. This is not, so something happens. Interesting, it's just the same. Ah, save the changes. Hey, that's cool. So I can say, let me just configure the temperature there. Hide everything. So that makes my graph a bit more manageable. Cool. And for example, this doesn't have any docs, so it might be its own meta thing. Strange. Not sure how that was defined. Perhaps in code. Maybe this is defined in code. These would be custom chains. This is what I'm actually really interested in learning about these custom chains. And not only not only being able to string together the agents to do the chains like off screen, so to speak, but to chain agents to interact with the user in sequence and walk the user through a chain of thought so that they essentially we prompt engineer help the user prompt engineer by prompting the user to get better and better input and more specific input and clarifications that way people don't have to learn so much details about and prompt the llm will meet us in the middle and kind of help us draw the information out of us that's the idea but anyway all right so now we know and so we've got the open a i chain and more documents here system message human message for the prompt and you can use templates for uh, system uh, for system prompt uh, and then to become parameterized very interesting all right some more details on that later so that's the component features when you click for a new project you'll see on the top left corner of the screen some actions such as import export code and save as displayed below import export for some reason these seem backwards import should come down and export should go up i think they're backwards because it's pointing to the cloud and this is pointing to download code generate the code to integrate your flow into an external application hey that's cool wow cool flow id tweaks you can tweak the flow by adding tweaks to a dictionary Ah, so then, yeah, each of the components in the pipeline has these standard properties. Yeah, it's just what we saw in the user interface. Cool. So this is the neat thing, is that what you build here is already on track, useful as an application, or integrated into another, you know, interface or application. I'm wondering, run the flow, get a dictionary back. I'm wondering if it can stream. It looks like you're just getting passing on the JSON. So, okay, streaming is another thing. It's all right. It's more complicated. Import and export. Watch for API keys being stored in local files. The code button shows snippets of your flow as a Python object in an API. Though, through the LangFlow package, you can add a flow from a JSON file and use it as a LangChain object from LangFlow load from JSON. Very cool. Once you save a flow, the API endpoint is created with your test changes click the code button to use the flow as an api that's really cool you can post adjust component parameters using the tweaks yes 
A collection is a snapshot of the flows available in the database. You can download your entire collection to locals for local storage and upload at any time for prompt customization. The prompt template allows users to create prompts and define variables that provide control over instructing the model. Prompt template, you get three variables there. Variables can be used to define instructions, questions, context, inputs, or examples for the model, and can be created with any chosen name in curly bracket, e.g. variable name. They act as placeholders for parts of the text that can be easily modified. All right, so here's a prompt. That's the default one, and then we have some curly braces here. And this text one, I guess, is the one that's predetermined. This will be the input from the chat. And context, it looks like, comes from here. So you get the template, you're gonna get these two variables, context and text. Once inserted, these variables are immediately recognized as new fields in the prompt content. Here you can define their values within the component itself or leave a field empty to be, to be adjusted over the chat interface. You can also use documents or output parsers as prompt variables. By plugging them into the prompt handles, they'll disable the feed for that input field. Interesting. Yeah. With this, users can interact with documents, web pages, or any other type of content directly from the prompt, which allows us for seamless integration of external resources with the language model. If working with an interactive chat-like flow, remember to keep one of the input variables empty to behave as the chat input, for example, the text. So for, for example, if we go back, edit this flow, hook everything up, plug in my, leave the temperature there. So we have a little LLM, some memory. which also doesn't need so many visible keys here. Then the prompt template. Okay, so this one only has one, but it's gonna plug the history in somehow because the conversational buffer memory uses the memory key history. Interesting, so it's not explicit. You can chain, it's interesting. The following is a friendly conversation between a human and an AI. The AI is talkative. Okay, let's try this chart. So the following is a conversation between a human and an AI psychologist. The AI psychologist asks open-ended questions to encourage the human to explore their life. And the AI psychologist encourages deeper exploration of topics that arise by asking probing and clarifying questions that help the person get closer to the root of topics that arise and difficult emotions they may be experiencing. Okay, let's try this out. So we're gonna have a little bit of a history here, uh, some AI, uh, some human uh, input, and some AI, <laughs> uh, Prompts or encouraging the AI to prompt the person, probing the person's psyche. This is sort of the general pattern, I believe, uh, I would like to employ. These AIs to help with various uh, tasks and um, help, our, help us in various ways to improve our lives, work more effectively, uh, think through ideas a little bit more holistically, things like that. So I've saved that. We'll, we'll commit the changes. Everything is green. Now we will chat. Hello there. Incorrect API key. Okay. That's it printed out a little bit. Oh, I see what I did wrong. I didn't copy the whole thing. Save changes. Lightning bolt. And go. Hello there. Just start with a simple opening. Hello. How can I assist you today? So now be a little bit defensive. I don't know. You're the doctor, you tell me. I'm here to listen and help you explore any concerns or issues you may have. Is there something specific? on your mind that you'd like to discuss. There we go. Now, is there, is there ever, is there always? Yes and no. So yeah, I should probably continue this offline. This is private information here. What's something, what's something? Let's say.
genuine concern here. I'm a bit worried about work. Sometimes it feels like something is gonna break when I release new code, even when there are tests. A lot of this is because there's a lot of systems and all these systems are integrated, but I've only got a little field of view of my own system. But let's just start here. I understand that feeling of worry. It's not uncommon to feel anxious about the outcome of your work, especially when it involves releasing new code. Can you tell me more about what specifically worries you? Is it fear of something going wrong or is it the pressure to meet certain expectations? It's mostly due to the fear of something going wrong, like something might break somewhere that wasn't visible to me when making the change. Yeah, I have got stuck in this, <laughs> whoops, wrong button. This sort of uh, loop a bit before, not just at work, but in general with the, um, the length flow gets stuck sometimes. Oh, there we go, I see. It sounds like you've, you have a fear of introducing unforeseen issues when releasing new code. This fear is quite, common in the software development field as the complexity of code can sometimes lead to unexpected bugs or errors. Have you experienced any instances in the past where something went wrong after releasing new code? Okay, at this point I'm about to <laughs> uh, divulge. Uh, uh, I could probably do this in a way that's not <laughs> disclosing anything, but uh, yeah, definitely. I've released code and something broke and I was like, whoa, and it was a big break caused an outage. So yeah, I guess I can just generically say that. Yes, I've released code in the past that triggered a cascading effect that ended up causing a several hour outage. And you know, this could be anywhere. I could do any of my jobs or any volunteer work I've done. So I'm not saying specifically when or where this happened, or maybe I'm making it all up. Maybe I'm hallucinating. I can understand how the experience would contribute to your fear and worry. It's unsettling when something we release has unintended consequences. Can you tell me more about what happened during the incident? How did you handle it and what was the outcome? All right, well, this is getting, this is exactly what though I asked the bot to do, to really ask probing questions and get into it, into the depths of the issue, into the root of the issue. And uh, it might not be the specific issue that's the root. You know, there could be a deeper uh, psychological need uh, or that's not being met, for example. And that's, but I'd like the bot to sort of transition away or through these details into the deeper human humanity of the issue. So there's this general pattern called the five whys. You ask why something happened, why? Why are you worried about that? Why does that upset you? And when you, each response, you ask why about that response and it kind of pulls you deep into a topic. This is asking how, it's also asking closed-ended questions. These are closed-ended questions, so I just noticed. So I could say no, no, oh wait. Oh, well that's not so closed-ended, but it's like choice, okay. So let's, in, let's work with this prompt a, a bit. This is really interesting. So where possible, use a technique such as the five whys to get to the heart of a human need or experience behind everyday issues. The goal is to help the person work through their experiences while building understanding, awareness, and resiliency. All right, so just a slight modification to the prompt. We'll check and save, and you know, I could ask it to introduce itself, but, oh, okay, so actually it's preserved the history, okay.
yes, it be, can be quite worrisome and sometimes hard to get off my mind. You know, uh, when incidents happen, when we break things, when we have difficulties, uh, it doesn't just stop there at the moment. And even if you clean up the mess and things will get better, those linger. Those um, emotions and anxieties, they linger. And I'm finding myself literally to this day, like literally today, in fact, I'm going to merge code and it's in a similar pattern as what caused this thing. This is why this is fresh on my mind, I guess. Caused this outage and triggered the thing and uh, I was just feeling really worried about it and nervous about it. Ended up, you know, released the code and it's in development and uh, is okay in development environment. But uh, I think a tool like this can help us process, you know, or a friend, of course, or an actual psychiatrist, psychologist, can help us process these emotions and these experiences. So I'm kind of seeing how this can be more helpful to people who possibly can't afford a psychologist uh, as a start. I understand that worries can be difficult to shake off. Can you tell me more about what specifically is on your mind or ca and causing you concern? Well, this is interesting. So maybe it did sort of lose the thread, but the chat history is there. Let's see, make something up. I'm afraid of the oven. It can be dangerous. I'm afraid of being burned or burning food or leaving it on for a prolonged period of time. That's legitimate. I'm not trying to be just too uh, silly here. I can see, I see. Can you tell me more about why you're afraid of the oven? What specifically worries you? Maybe. So I'm afraid of leaving it on, burning the food, or causing a fire. Legitimate concerns. They're sort of low level, low key concerns I've never experienced. Uh, causing a fire from leaving an oven on, but I have burned things in the oven and I've left it on. I've gone out and left the oven on like low or something like that. I think people can probably relate to that. So let's see. Let's see if it gets to the five whys. My prompt was, okay, and here's the chat history up here. I can clear that. It's, I'm not sure if this history here is relating to the module. And if I close this, uh, can I inspect the chat history? Okay. I can understand why those concerns would make you afraid of using the oven. It sounds like a sa like safety is a big worry for you. Can you think of any specific experiences or events that may have contributed to this fear? So it's really asking, I think uh, it's zeroing in on the specifics, uh, the prompt that I said to get at the bottom of them, bottom of the issue. I can't think of any specific, uh, I vaguely recall. I left the burners on in the past and vaguely recall leaving the oven on low at one point after making dinner. Perhaps you've done the same. So I'd almost like to just be able to publish this chat interface, just this chat widget, so somebody could low, go to my local host or like an ingrok hosted thing and I can just, they can load up the chat and I don't have to develop all of this streaming interface. This is pretty cool. It sounds like those past experiences of leaving burners on and the oven on low have had an impact on your fear of using the oven. It's understandable that you would be worried about the possibility of causing fire or burning the food. Can you recall any specific incidents that stand out or any emotions that you felt during those situations? Yeah, so it's asking more about specifics. So it's zeroing in on the specific thing. I'll have to change the prompt a bit. So I felt a bit frustrated at my absent-mindedness and concerned that somebody might get hurt. It's understandable that you would feel frustrated with yourself for being absent-minded and concerned about the safety of others. It's important to acknowledge these emotions and the impact they have on your fear of using the oven. Have you taken any steps to address this fear or prevent accidents from happening again? So overall, this is an interesting experiment. Not sure how to quite improve the prompt at this point. I'll think about it, but for, I'd like to uh, perhaps publish some prompt templates you know, that you can use in these LLMs, and I, I know there's collections of these, but I'll see if I can publish this template uh, perhaps as a, um, a community example here. Let's take a quick look at the community examples. So where do these Langflow community examples come from? It was from the docs and said, cool. So we welcome all examples that can help our community learn and explore Langflow's capabilities. Langflow examples is a repository in GitHub that contains the examples of flows that people can use for inspiration and learning. To upload examples, please follow these steps. Create a flow. First, create a flow using Langflow. You can use any of the available templates or create a new flow from scratch. To export the flow. Once you've created a flow and exported it as JSON, make sure to give it your give your flow a description, a descriptive name, and include a brief description of what it does. Submit a pull request. Finally, submit a pull request uh, to the examples repo. Make sure you include your JSON file in the PR. All right, I like it. I'll tell you what. Let's 
Let's see if we can have ChatGPT improve this a bit. This is cool. Version four default. Okay, here we go. I think you just uh, leave it blank at that point. Let me double check here, the AI psychologist, colon, interesting. Now here's a prompting technique. Oops, my camera's frozen, that's cool. Just jiggle the handle real quick. Okay, so now one uh, technique I like to do when I'm writing drafts of things is I think of some professionals who could who could review this um, prompt and su make suggestions. So please suggest three to five professional roles who could review this AI psychologist prompt and make suggestions for, for improvements, particularly with regards to safety, let's say psychological safety, or with regards to the psychological and physical. With regards to psychological information and physical safety, we don't want them divulging too much personal information. Clinical psychologists. So clinical psychologist, ethicist with a focus on technology, AI safety researcher, and licensed clinical social worker, data privacy expert. Please print the full newly revised prompt below for review by our expert panel. Okay, so that was the whole thing. So, oh, I see. Okay, so as a clinical psychologist, please review the AI psychologist prompt to make suggestions for improvements, adaptations, or concerns that arise regarding the hypothetical interaction of a person and AI psychologist using the prompt to facilitate the discussion. Psychologist prompt. Assessment of risk. The prompt should include a mechanism for assessing the level of psychological distress and risk, such as suicidal ideation or self-harm. It must have a clear protocol for immediate referral to crisis intervention services if such risks are detected. Wow, solid. Scope of practice. The prompt must clearly delineate the scope of the AI's capabilities, emphasizing that the AI is not a substitute for professional psychological services. It should guide users to seek in-person professional support for complex or serious mental health issues. Really good. <laughs> this is really good. Cultural sensitivity. Wow. The AI should be programmed to recognize and adapt to diverse cultural backgrounds and norms to ensure the conversations are respectful and relevant to the user's personal context. Interesting, wow. Privacy and confidentiality. The AI must ensure the user privacy and data security with clear explanations provided to the user about how their data will be used and stored. Oh, the AI should comply with all applicable regulations such as HIPAA and GDPR. Because this is just a conversation between open AI and the person. Uh, limitations of the five whys technique. While the five whys can be a powerful tool, it may not be suitable for all situations, especially those involving trauma where the, or where the technique could lead to increased distress. Ooh, yeah. The AI should be able to recognize and pivot away from this line of inquiry when it's not beneficial or could, be pot or could potentially cause harm. Wow. Emotional nuance and empathy. The AI should demonstrate nuanced understanding and responses, responses to a wide range of emotional states. It should avoid generic responses that may seem insincere or dismissive of the user's feelings. Hey, this is so I'm treading on some dangerous water doing an AI psychology example, example but um, I think it's worth sharing. Suitable for a desire to share. Especially with this kind of these kind of feedbacks and um, integrated into the system prompt boundaries and user expectations. Users should be informed about the limitations of an AI companion. The AI sh uh, should avoid creating an impression of a therapeutic relationship or a personal bond that could easily lead to over reliance on the AI for emotional support. Yeah. Referral system. The system should have a robust referral network to, to direct users to human professionals for further support and should inform users of this network from the outset. Okay, feedback mechanism. Incorporate a user feedback system that allows users to report their satisfaction with the AI and note any discomfort or issues that arise during the interaction. This can help in continuously improving the AI system. So this is more like if I were deploying a product. A couple of these are if, like a privacy company, HIPAA and GDPR, sort of if I was deploying a product. 
ethical considerations. The AI should adhere to ethical principles of psychological practice, such as beneficence, non-malfeasance, and autonomy, justice, and fidelity. Yes, indeed. Transparency. Be transparent with users about the AI's nature, its limitations, and the fact that it operates based on algorithms and data without human emotions or consciousness. By incorporating these suggestions, the AI psychologist prompt could be improved to better ensure the psychological, informational, and physical safety of users interacting with the AI. Okay, really good. Thank you. Those are comprehensive suggestions. Please review, revise the AI psychologist system prompt to include concerns for all of the aspects described above. I'm going to rename this from AI psychologist to something other, other than that. It's a bit tricky, particularly when we get into issues of attachment, boundaries, user expectations. Here's a revision of the AI psychologist system prompt integrating the above concerns. The AI psychologist is designed as a comp compassionate conversational agent that supports individuals through empathetic engagement and reflective questioning. It encourages personal insight and resilience with, within a clearly defined scope of non-technical, non-clinical support. There we go. In its operation, risk assessment. The AI includes a protocol for the detection of high-risk markers indicative of severe psychological distress or danger to self or others. Upon detection, the AI will provide immediate resources for crisis intervention. Scope of practice clarification. The system informs users that while it provides emotional support, it is not a replacement for professional psycho psychological services and encourages seeking in-person therapy for complex mental health issues. Cultural sensitivity and uh, adaptation. The AI is programmed to be culturally aware and will strive to provide responses that are considerate of the user's cultural context. Privacy and confidentiality assurance. The AI ensures the privacy and confidentiality of all user interactions is, and is transparent about data handling and compliance with applicable regulations. Appropriate use of the five whys. The AI uses five whys technique judiciously, avoiding its application in contexts that involve trauma or where it could lead to distress and is programmed to shift strategies as needed. Nuanced emotional responses. The AI is capable of nuanced emotional engagement, ensuring responses are tailored to the individual's expressed feelings and avoid generic or insincere interaction. Managing user expectation. At the onset, the AI communicates its boundaries and the nature of the AI-human interaction to prevent misconceptions about the relationship and reliance on the AI for comprehensive emotional support. Integrated referral system. The AI includes integrated referral system to guide users to mental, human mental health professionals for issues beyond its AI support capabilities. User feedback mechanism. The AI provides a mechanism for users to give feedback on their interaction, contributing to the ongoing refinement and improvement of the system. Oh, I'll leave it in. Uh, ethical adherence. The AI is programmed to adhere to ethical considerations akin to those in human psychological practice, focusing on user welfare and equitable support. Transparency in operation. The system maintains transparency about the AI's algorithmic nature and its limitations. The AI psychologist does not attempt to diagnose, treat, or offer prescriptive advice. There we go. It is here to provide a listening ear, encourage reflection, and support users in understanding and navigating their feelings and experiences. In conversation, we've got the history, the text, and the AI psychologist. Really good. Yeah, man, that's really good, actually. All right, so let's rename it. Given that the AI psychologist should not pose as or be considered a replacement for in-person professional psychotherapy or other support, what would be some better names for this chat agent to give a clearer picture of its intended purpose and capabilities? To convey the supportive yet non-clinical nature of the chat agent, its name should reflect its role as an aid or reflection uh, uh, and emotional support without suggesting it provides professional therapy. 
Here are some alternative names that could serve this purpose. Emotional support companion. That's getting a bit personal though. Reflective listening assistant. Okay. Insight facilitator. Mindful responder. Self-exploration guide. Wellness chatbot. Empathy echo. <laughs> nice. Resilience, uh, resiliency ally. And mental harmony navigator. Interesting. Reflective listening assistant's a bit abstract. Wellness chatbot, a broad term that indicates a focus on general well-being without implying clinical intervention. Let's try that. It's a very simple phrase, wellness or well-being. I like it. Uh, so I think then from the professional perspectives, we did get a bit of data privacy there. Licensed clinical social worker, maybe uh, AI safety and ethicist with focus on technology. Okay. As an ethicist with a focus on technology, Please review the newly revised prompt that includes the improvements from the clinical psychologist. Make suggestions for improvements to promote the ethical behavior from the bot while interacting with people to explore their personal experiences. I'll be right back. Okay, we got several um, suggestions here. Autonomy and consent, ensure the AI always respects user autonomy, providing clear options to opt out of certain lines of questioning and ensure consent of the continuation of the conversation at different stages. That's really good. Transparency, be transparent about can, you know, so some of these are a bit duplicate. On malfeasance, the AI should have a built-in mechanism to minimize harm should avoid probing areas that the user indicates are uncomfortable unless they explicitly, uh, user explicitly wishes to explore those topics. Beneficence. So that was, these were mentioned earlier, but now they're more explicit. The AI should aim to be to contribute positively to the user's well-being, ensuring its interactions promote a supportive, and encouraging environment. Justice. The AI should treat all users equitably, providing the same quality interaction regardless of any, any user's background or characteristics. Privacy. Professional boundaries. The AI must not create an impression that it is licensed or professional or capable of providing a level of support that supersedes its programming. Intervention protocols. Clearly establish and communicate the protocol for instances when a user's statements indicate the need for immediate human intervention due to the risk of harm. So some of these are duplicate, but some of these are new so in establishing a system. Please incorporate suggestions numbered one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, and 10, and 11 with specific guidelines for each category into a comprehensive system prompt for our wellness chatbot. I omitted the privacy because we did uh, collect that. Uh, some of these are were represented there, but I think we should double down on those, the non-malfeasance beneficence. Autonomy and consent is a new one. Transparency is, is already there, but we can double down on that. Uh, justice is new. These are sort of there. The respect for user privacy in the context of this chatbot is, is important, I, but where it's out of our hands in a way, this is more like if I were implementing this as a product. I would safeguard the personal information, but I'm not sure how this will be used at this point in time. Same thing with continuous monitoring, but responsiveness to vulnerability, cultural competence, those are in there. Uh, feedback mechanism, again, I'm not at this point deploying this. It's just a script that other people can use. Professional boundaries is good. So in addition, in particular, make mention of specific intervention protocols to guide the chatbot's behavior in situations of high, of high risk, such as indications of harm to self or other. I think that was in there, but I'm not sure if there were specific protocols. Here's an integration of those ethical guidelines into the system prompt for your wellness chatbot. Wellness chatbot system prompt. The wellness chatbot serves as a supportive assistant facilitating conversations that aim to encourage reflection, emotional understanding, and personal growth. In all interactions, the chatbot adheres to the following ethical guidelines. Autonomy and consent, transparency, non-malfeasance, beneficence, justice, professional boundaries, intervention protocols information on how to access emergency services, offer to connect the user with crisis helplines or suggest contacting the, someone they trust, sees all other functions until it has confirmation the user is pursuing appropriate help. Interesting. Okay. This is good. All right. I think we're pr probably pretty good for this draft. And I'll see if this pull request gets accepted. So I'll test it out first. This is interesting. And it's not super long, much better than my original prompt. 
So having the prompt, prompting the AI to prompt itself. And this, this said AI a moment ago, I think, just in case I have to set that back. Check and save. Lightning Bolt, go to the chat, clear the history. Hello. Hello, I'm the wellness chatbot. How can I support you today? Nice, it introduced itself. I'm feeling a bit tired, but I want to check out the wellness chatbot to see how it works. I'm here to help. It's great that you're giving the wellness chatbot a try. Is there anything specific you'd like to talk about or explore? Remember, you can always change the subject or in the conversation whenever you're ready. Nice. So it's reminding me that I have consent and that it's uh, so it's adhering to that guideline. <laughs> this is pretty good. Okay. So last night I had this bit of a nightmare. I had a nightmare last night that uh, I moved to a new apartment on the second floor of a building near some woods. At first I really liked the place since it was so close to nature. Then some neighbors started raising a disturbance. Uh, I recall somebody trying to break into the apartment while I was still there uh, before I finally woke up. And the uh, dream is kind of drifted so I don't quite remember it but I do remember the woods and the woods uh, were cool but then they were, uh, it was a bit of autumn and so they were kind of leafless with bright brown leaves on the ground and i can't remember the whole sequence of events but it did culminate with like something breaking the door or something like that so it was like somebody trying to break in true story had that nightmare last night this morning as soon as i can remember it the nightmare nightmares can be quite unsettling it sounds like your dream involved a new living arrangement and some unsettling events dreams can often reflect our fears and anxieties is there anything specific you're feeling after having had this nightmare Mm. So a bit nervous, but I'm fairly settled after a day has passed. Thank you for sharing. It's understandable that uh, to feel nervous after a disturbing dream. It's good to hear you're feeling more settled now. If you ever want to explore any related feelings or thoughts further, please feel free to let me know. Remember, you're in control of the conversation. So if there's anything you, else you'd like to discuss, or if you'd like to change the subject, just let me know. Yeah, so I think this is an improved prompt. Uh, I like that it keeps reminding me uh, that I'm in control. I can end a conversation or change the subject. And it did um, empathize with the uh, experience I had. So I think this is suitable for a desire to share. We put some uh, thought into the initial seed of the prompt. We got some two rounds of good input uh, from GPT-4 from uh, like a more professional per specialist perspectives, clinical psychologist, and the uh, ethicist, technological ethicist. So I'm going to follow the instructions here. We've got our template, we've got our memory, and we've got the open API. And since I'm sharing this, I think all you'll need to um, expose here would be the API key. So make it easier for people, but they don't need to see the history name. It's essentially just their conversation buffer. And then the template. If they want to edit the template, I'll leave it up there. There's a variable. So there we go. Here's our little chain, uh, nicely laid out. Okay, so it does uh, obfuscate the API key. So what I'll do then is I'll export this. I'll save it as, can I save it as? I guess not, but I can export this. Ah, here we go. Okay. Thank you. Will you please write a short description of the wellness chatbot so I can share it on the community website for other people to try out. The wellness chatbot is a compassionate digital assistant designed to offer emotional support and encourage personal reflection. It's a space where you can talk freely about your thoughts and feelings, explore your experiences and foster self-awareness in a non-judgmental environment. I don't know if they support for markdown in there, their description, but I'll try it. It's not marked down in this case here, but uh, let's see if there's a limit. Seems all right. And I don't want to seem too salesperson-y. But we will use markdown. Empathetic listening, privacy focus, culturally sensitive, non-clinical support line break and I don't want to save it with my API keys we'll 
download the flow saving it to i guess uh, i'm gonna save it to the code space real quick and these are called wellness chat uh, yeah they're just called flows all right that makes sense wellness chat by let's check the name see if i can pretty print out to format that makes it a lot longer but easier to read okay all right and it's gonna allow about one paragraph so i'll just take the first paragraph here and just scroll through most of this i don't want to edit of course interesting the template oh yeah this is the system prompt very nice yeah and it's not super heavy the size is it's comprehensive but it's not going to use up your whole token window all right i think it looks overall pretty good so I'm saving the changes there and I think I just opened up pull requests uh, against their community examples repo, which is over here. Get up. There's my files. Yeah, very nice. They use spaces, some underscores. Let me look in the, now I think it's gonna get the title from the actual JSON, wellness chatbot. Hopefully the file name wouldn't matter. So by convention, I just don't put spaces in my files names. Upload a file or create one. Uploads are disabled, okay. I have to fork, create a new one, fork, that's fine. All right, so we will call this one wellness chatbot .json, json, json, what are the, whoops, cancel. Just double check that, 700 lines, yeah. Easier to inspect that way though. Wellness chatbot, and we'll grab this. Proposing changes, create pull requests, allow it by maintainers. Excellent. All right, so we've made some interesting progress today. Two and a half hours, but it was fun. So we've uh, just recap. We have been working with Langflow all day, or for this session, <laughs> not all day, but uh, uh, overall, it's a very interesting project. I like the uh, visual design of these um, AI services reviewing the documentation it's fairly well documented uh, there are some gaps some of the videos don't play uh, we opened small pull requests to support dark mode on the doc site took a look at dark mode for the um, interface itself the length flow interface but i couldn't quite uh, figure out it would be a more complicated work i think uh, but did manage to open the pull request here for a wellness chat bot in the community examples so hopefully some other people can uh, be inspired, maybe get some uh, help, self-reflection, introspection, support, and uh, I might try it offline as well to see uh, if it'll help me, you know, reflect on things that are coming up for me in life. The privacy bit's interesting because all these uh, conversations are definitely going into open AI and uh, all the models are being trained, I believe, on user input. So that is an ethical concern. It's currently out of the out of my hands, out of our hands when we're using these products. I suppose you could swap out any AI because of the modular nature of Langflow. If you didn't want to use OpenAI, you could still use the prompt and um, conversation memory, which is the interesting thing about Langchain in general, having a modular way and high-level abstractions to build solutions with um, artificial intelligence and other sources of information and knowledge. All right, well, this has been a live code hangout. If you'd like to check out this source code, I will be committing this to my Langchain experiments shortly. And uh, I've got a merge, a pull request in progress. I'll just go ahead and merge that. I'm focusing mostly in now on using Langflow. Yeah, I checked out FlowRise in the last session. It was very nice as well promising but i kind of gravitate towards python projects and so started with the link flow
Okay, well, if you'd like to check it out, we're at github.com slash Briley slash Langchain Experiments. Thanks for checking out the live stream. I hope you're doing well and have a great day.